Hello, my name is Mark Latino, and I work for the Reliability Center, and I'm here to talk to you about basic failure analysis. What is basic failure analysis? Well, basic failure analysis is a part of the Reliability Center's two-track approach for failure avoidance. Two-track approach consists of the significant few, which are the 20% of the problems that are causing 80% of the losses. For these kinds of items, we use a advanced or proact root cause analysis method. The advanced method, you have to have a principal analyst lead a team because this is one of the kinds of problems that um, it would have been solved and because it's not, we're going to put a team together. Uh, it involves all levels of the organization and third parties. We bring in people from the outside. Uh, it should be full-time, but in many cases it's only part-time because of resource issues out in the industry right now. But we do true root cause analysis on these kinds of problems. Uh, it's extremely disciplined because we're going to follow the methodology, we pay high attention to detail, and we verify everything that we do. Now on the other end of the spectrum, we have what we call the vital many, and we use the tool called basic failure analysis to solve those remaining problems. We put this into the hands of the hourly and first line supervisory level and what they are to do is, on a part-time basis, solve these smaller problems. The reason we do this is that we found that, uh, historically, that the small chronic problems that get ignored, a lot of times will queue up in a certain pattern and over time become one of the big problems. And we feel if we can nip a lot of these things in the bud by using the people closest to the work to do that, and they are uniquely qualified for this as well, because they do spend a lot of time uh, very close to the equipment, so they know this equipment very well. And their, um, their rate of effectiveness is actually rather high, 60 to 80 percent. We use basic problem solving skills with this, and there is less attention to detail. But like I said, there is a, you know, probably a 60 to 80 percent effective rate as far as uh, eliminating pieces of the problem. Together, we cover 100 percent of the failure. And we're going to focus most on, um, basically, on the BFA. BFA, working in conjunction with root cause analysis, has a tremendous amount of impact on an organization. But the basic failure analysis is handling the reactive type stuff. It leaves us open for the proactive stuff for the um, main root cause analysis method. We identify using FMEAs, failure modes and effects analysis, opportunity analysis, the major losses in the plant, and we go after those using the high-powered PROACT root cause. But everything else we can use the basic failure analysis and almost always meet requirements. So together they are very powerful. Some of the major differences. RCA, of course, we're going to use and do true root cause analysis. Basic failure analysis is problem solving. It's not root cause analysis. Facilitator is required for root cause analysis. You work independently with a BFA. When you're collecting your 5P data, the RCA is very in-depth and very detailed. We have to make sure that we get all the data that we need collected so that we can examine it. The 5P for the BFA is usually whatever data is available. So we use available data for that. Generally not that hard to get hold of. RCA when we're building our logic tree, all possibilities have got to be exposed for each hypothesis. In BFA, we get as many possibilities as we can think of, as we know. The verification of hypotheses, however, in RCA, we have a whatever it takes attitude. That means if we have to get a, you know, five or six thousand dollar finite element test, we're going to go do that. It's a whatever it takes mentality. Verification for BFA is the best we can do internally with what we have. And it's not uh, that bad either, by the way. With RCA, we have to expose all three root levels. Physical roots, the human intervention roots, and the latent system roots. In BFA, at a minimum, we want to expose physical roots, but occasionally they do go deeper, and that's okay. With RCA, we have to eliminate the failure mechanism. Those are all the pieces that added up to cause this event to occur. So we want to eliminate that mechanism. In basic failure analysis, or 
aim really is to increase mean time between failure. We want to improve stuff, and we want it not to fail as much. And occasionally we might even eliminate it. But the real goal here is to increase mean time between failure for, for continuous improvement. Now in the class for a basic failure analysis, these are some of the topics that it includes. And I'm not going to go into all of them. Um, this is really not necessary at this point. But I will say that we're going to compare RCA versus troubleshooting. This is very important to know the difference when you're actually out there doing failure analysis. We're going to talk about sporadic and chronic events and how they differ as far as um, going after them to solve them. We're also going to talk about how an analysis becomes disconnected. We're going to talk about the components that are missing from a disconnected analysis versus doing it the right way. We talk about primary versus secondary failures. And primary failures, that's the first detectable signal that you have an issue. Usually that's a component that's telling you that it's um, starting to go bad. Most of the time when that happens, there's no action taken. When inaction is taken too often, we will go into secondary failure. Secondary failure means that we've gone into catastrophic failure, and not only the primary defect is, is, is there, but we've taken other components along with it. So it's a much longer downtime now. And then what we're going to talk about is the five-step basic failure analysis method. Now, basic failure analysis is very simple. We've got to come up with a way to generate a list of BFA candidates. Usually people use triggers for that. Once we know what we're going to work on, we have to go out and we have to collect 5P data. And uh, you need to have data in order to solve problems. 5P data is parts, position, people, paradigms, and paper. Under those five categories, if we take them as a guideline, we will be able to collect all the data that we need to solve any problem. Step three, we're going to build a top box. A top box is a problem definition, and it must be factual. Those are the facts of the event, because what we want to do is we want to start with facts. Then we want to go to step four, and we want to start to formulate hypotheses on how each of the modes could have occurred. From there, we verify whether they happened or not using some sort of test. Once we know what has happened, then we'll document the results and we'll make recommendations. Now to show you this, I decided to use one incident, and it's PCH116, which is a pump. And PCH116 has had a number of failures. Well, it just so happens that PCH116 is one of a series of pumps. We also have PCH118, 117, and 115. They all have failed more than once in the past 10 months. The mean time between failure is about six weeks for each of the pumps. There is evidence of lube contamination because we've seen contaminant in the bottom of the sump. There is also evidence of pipe strain because we've seen it in the past that some of the pipes are not lined up exactly right. The pumps are aligned using precision laser alignment when they're installed by the millwrights. Operating practices observed indicate that the equipment is operating correctly. We've talked to the operators. We see what the operators have been doing. The operators are operating the system, as far as we know, the correct way. The equipment vibration, at least over all levels, are deemed to be acceptable levels. Mechanical seal failures occur most often with bearings being second. Now, for our five Ps, some of the parts that we might want to collect, since we know that the number one reason is mechanical seals are failing, well, maybe we should collect some of these failed seals, and then we'll open them up and we'll inspect them. We also probably want to look at the cooling water, because the water that cools the seals, yeah, maybe that's got some contaminants in it too that's causing problems. So we should get a sample of that and send it out for analysis. We also should get some of the failed bearings, because that is number two reason for replacement. So we'll get some of those, we'll split them open, and we'll see what the evidence Says. As long as we're doing that, we might as well get our lubrication samples, send those out. We also want to take a look at the fasteners, make sure we got the correct fasteners, uh, they're in the correct patterns, all those kinds of things. We want to look at the sealing material and make sure that we have the right sealing material for the service that we are uh, asking it to do or provide. And we also ought to get some uh, water treatment samples and have those things tested as well. 
Now, we also want to talk to some people. We probably ought to talk to operators. They're very close to the equipment. Uh, they run it every day. They may know some things that are going on that uh, might, might help us. We ought to need to talk to the mechanics who work on this equipment day in and day out. We should talk to the stockroom attendant because they're the ones who are, you know, delivering these new parts. They should have parts usage reports. They also may know if we've changed vendors or not recently. Uh, we want to talk to the rebuild shop mechanics because they also rebuild these pumps and rebuild as well. Positional data might be those flange positions we were talking about earlier. Let's see if, uh, how far they are misaligned and we'll see if we think that that has some kind of a, um, an effect on these seal failures. We also might want to look at uh, seal and bearing alignment patterns. We can look at that when we inspect the parts. We also want to look at valve positions, especially the cooling water. You know, the cooling water to the mechanical seal, were the valves completely open, were they partially open? We should probably know that. We also should look at uh, process throughput changes. You know, we uh, increased the speed of our processing or any of the process variations uh, changed. We don't know, so we should check that. Paper documentation might consider getting some installation procedures for the uh, mechanical seals, maybe even for the pumps. Uh, we should most certainly know what the operating procedure says we're supposed to be doing, as well as looking at the maintenance histories especially ones going back about 72 hours to see if we've had any uh, recent replacements of mechanical seals that maybe we could have installed them wrong or something. We should also look at sample analysis reports. We sent a number of things out for analysis like the lubrication and the um, treatment water. We should uh, get those reports and bring those along with us when we go to build our logic tree. We also might want to look at materials received documentation as well as um, MSDS documentation, material safety data sheets. Now, once we have all of our five Ps, well, now we need to start our logic tree. Now, the way we do a logic tree in BFA is we start with an event box. And we decided that if we solve for PCH116, whatever we learn from PCH116 might be transferable back into the other pumps that are having problems as well. So let's start with reoccurring PCH116 pump failures. And now we have to know the facts that are, are the things that are causing PCH116 to have failures. So if we look back into our, our maintenance histories and talk to people, we'll find out that mechanical seal failures were number one. We know that. We also know that bearing failures are number two. But there were so, also some notations in the book that where hot bearings were also uh, considered uh, bad and they were replaced. And another reason was for blown seals. So we, uh, we have blown seals, hot bearings, bearing failures, and mechanical seals. And they're all facts. They comprise our top box and are our problem definition. Now if we solve for mechanical seal, bearing failure, hot bearings, and blown seals, our recurring PCH116 pump failures should be minimized or go away. So where do we start? We have to go down one of the modes first. Well, we have that data. 55% of the time, the mechanical seals are failing. 25% of the time, we have bearing failures. 5% of the time, we have hot bearings. And 15% of the time, we have blown seals. Let's start with mechanical seal failures. Now, under mechanical seal failures, we want to ask the question, how can how can a mechanical seal failure occur? Well, our data shows that we can misalign the mechanical steel when we install it. That would cause it to fail. We can also have it restricted or not getting cooling water, and it would be that would cause it to overheat. And if it overheats, it would fail. We could also have corrosion, and corrosion could eat away the mechanical seal material and cause mechanical seal to fail. And we could also erode the material away and once again cause it to fail. And we could also have a variation of all four of those conditions. But based on the five Ps that we've collected, we find that maybe 5% of the time we see some signs of misalignment. 25% of the time we see signs of overheating. 65% of the ones pulled, we found that we have some corrosion issues. And 5% of the time, 
we have some erosion issues. So I think maybe we should file a corrosion. So under corrosion, we say, well, how can we have corrosion? Well, corrosion can come from the external environment, ambient environment, maybe some uh, extra humidity, or maybe there's some acid mixed in with the air. Things like that might cause it. But we find that that's not the case. There's no change in the external environment. So now we know it has to be in the internal environment. So 100% of the time, it must be in the internal environment. So now we have to pick that apart. How can it be in the internal environment? Well, the only way it can be there is it's either a part of the product has some corrosive something to it, which we find is not the case because we checked that and the product is exactly the same process as we've been running. But now we get into the additives that go into the um, water that cools the mechanical seal. Well, we find that they're not compatible with the seal material and that because of that, it's being corroded. So now we look in a little deeper and we find that the, um, the water treatment chemical has changed. We're using a different brand and a different type. Well, nobody knew this. Why did nobody know this? Well, there was no system in place to test the new additives before they actually purchased them. If they had tested it and they knew the effects, then we wouldn't have had to purchase it and we could have kept running along with the same one that we know works. But because we had to purchase it, once it's purchased, they're going to use it. And of course, that's where all our problems started. So if we work this back, we find that because we had no system in place to test the new additives, we ended up buying a chemical change or a new product that was not compatible with our seal material, which caused corrosion, which caused the seal to fail. Okay? Our latent root or our system is that we do not have this system in place to test new additives. The human root is that we actually bought it without doing any testing or any uh, management of change or anything. Okay, that's the human root. Physical root is that if the additive had not been changed, it had not been there, this, the failure would not have occurred. So the, the fact that the two combined and caused corrosion is the physical root. So now I ask myself, if I fix this problem, will that affect any of my other modes? Well, as it turns out, when mechanical seals fail, they build heat, and the heat will transfer down the shaft, and of course the bearings are attached to the shaft. Therefore, it could be a source of some of the bearing failures, and it most certainly could be a source for hot bearings as well as blown seals. So if we go back and we look at our original percentages, well, I think the 55% will be knocked out completely if we correct this. Now, the bearing failures are more than were 25% before. There are other reasons that bearings have failed, and we have that in the maintenance histories. But 15% of them are failing because of these mechanical seals are transferring heat to the bearings. And if we knock out the hot bearings and the blown seals, well, we've knocked out 80% of the problem. What we'd like to do is make these changes and see how these changes affect the pumps in question. And if all of our failure rates start to come down by getting this system in place, getting the correct chemicals back in place, then we, there's no need to go any further. And, um, and our project can stop here, and we'll just make our recommendations. I would like to thank you for participating in basic failure analysis. And we can always be reached at www.reliability.com. Thank you very much.